hi all uh, welcome back to the second part of uh, my lecture of uh, minimal intervention dentistry uh, i hope all of you were uh, clear about uh, the the first part uh, i saw that most of you have uh, uh, seen it and gone through it i hope there are no queries uh, even if there are uh, please feel free to contact me so just a brief uh, recap before i go on to the second so the last lecture we had discussed about uh, just the basics of minimal intervention dentistry so uh, like i said before it is defined as the philosophy of uh, care which deals with the occurrence detection and earliest cure of the disease on microscopic levels yeah and followed by the minimally invasive treatment to repair the damage which is caused by the disease in our case uh, is the aspects of uh, minimal intervention dentistry uh, how to detect and diagnose there are many diagnostic tools uh dexis caribou is a recent advance uh, i'm sure you guys have gone through the videos as well uh then coming to the classification on uh, the lesions uh, based on the site and size this was given by mountain hume so although we do follow uh, the icdas uh, classification it's always good to know that mountain uh, hume's classification is also there so depending on the site whether it may be pit of fissure locations or the contact areas or in the cervical third of the teeth and uh, depending upon the size whether they may be minimal moderate enlarged or extensive you can always classify your lesion uh, the concept of caries removal uh, we had uh, started off in dentistry with uh, the extension for prevention which was given by the father of dentistry dr gb black uh, however now with the changing trends and changing concepts of dentistry because of uh, uh, tooth color restorations and restorations which can actually adhere to the tooth uh the principle has now changed to preservation for extension so bare minimal uh, preparation of the cavity and uh, bare minimal sacrifice of healthy tooth structure is what we follow now although you have to keep in mind that uh, the bare uh, minimum amount of cavity depth and width has to be created because uh, failing which uh, the restoration is not going to retain itself inside the oral cavity okay then coming to the prevention uh, we talked about the caries risk assessment which you are all more than familiar with uh, the patient's attitude how it has to be changed diet counseling uh, uh, the fluoride exposure the pool of fluoride and so on and uh, of course then we go on to talk about how fluoride works the the formation of fluorapatite uh, the antibacterial activity and the capability to remineralize uh, uh, the incipient uh, caries lesions uh, after that uh, we went on to talk about uh, caries uh, prevention measures uh, out of which we talked about the the tooth mousse which was uh, uh, popularized by gc uh, the company gc so gc's tooth mousse is uh, very much popular in the dental market Uh, then we talked about sensistat uh, nano hydroxide and we concluded with uh, the talk on ozone so uh, today i'm going to start off uh, with uh, the remaining the remainder portion of the lecture uh, so now we move on to infiltration so this is a kind of uh, pit and fissure sealant so basically you etch the tooth prep uh, the tooth uh, the tooth surface and uh, you have to infiltrate the the deep pit and fissures uh, with a low viscosity resin so it's very similar to your pit and fissure sealants so uh, basically it is just plugging the cavities so that uh, the caries cannot penetrate further and uh, also if there is any underlying caries below uh, it gets cut off from the nutrition supply from the oral cavity because of which it gets arrested and cannot progress any more yeah so uh, this is the infiltration uh, like i said it's very very similar to the pit and fissure sealants the videos of the pit and fissure sealants have already been shared in the previous lecture uh, i hope you guys have got it uh, coming to the restorations uh, like i said for minimal intervention dentistry we generally uh, practice the art of uh, art that is atraumatic restorative treatment so even if you do not have uh, i mean like atraumatic restorative treatment was actually practiced in areas where you know they did not have the facility of having a dental chair of having uh, an air rotor or a or a hand piece or a micro motor because of which they didn't have the capacity to, to drill uh, through the tooth so they just used the help of sharp instruments like the spoon excavator and they used uh, tooth colored uh, chemically adhering uh, restorative materials uh, the most commonly being uh, glass inomer cement so that is how they had been doing it 
uh, there are videos uh, on uh, atraumatic restorative re uh, rest uh, treatment which I have shared. I mean, the links are there below. You, uh, please feel free to access them and watch them. They're very simple videos and very helpful because it's something which can be practiced um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, next, uh, if you remember in the previous class, I had mentioned about silver diamine fluoride. Uh, this was uh, generally practiced in the department of uh, periodontics. 38% uh, silver diamine fluoride uh, was used, uh, very popular uh, back in the day. But uh, like I said, because of the aesthetic uh, appeal, uh, because now everyone is into aesthetics and for good reason too, because uh, the silver diamine fluoride, it looks uh, very similar to your amalgam fillings, uh, obviously because of the silver component. And uh, it can give a slightly ghastly appeal uh, to the patient's mouth and uh, th that is no longer, you know, uh, practiced. Uh, however, uh, silver diamine fluoride has known to cut uh, dental caries uh, and uh, it was used, uh, but now it has been replaced, of course, by your uh, resin composites and your glass anomer uh, restorations. You can, of course, use the combination of the two so you can get the best of both worlds. So you can have the resin modified uh, glass inomer as well. Uh, uh, this is what I was saying that uh, uh, instead of using your uh, air rotors and your micro motors, you can actually use the hand excavators to remove the carious tissues. Uh, the benefit being that uh, you do not do overzealous preparation and uh, there is lesser amount of bleeding, especially when the caries has attacked the cervical third of the tooth. So when you are preparing the cavity near the gingival margins, uh, the bleeding will be much lesser when you are using a hand excavator because you have judicious control and tactile sensation. So you can actually control the instrument. Whereas with the air rotor, the tactile sensation is lost and uh, you know it only comes with uh, experience and practice. Uh, nowadays, uh, like I said, uh, because we have uh, moved away from uh, G.V. Black's concept of uh, extension for prevention and now it is uh, preservation for extension, uh, or preservation of extension now we follow only the box only concept so basically we only create the cavity uh, the cavity prep uh, only in the uh, area which is required so we do not extend the cavity prep like in the olden days like for uh, the class twos and the class one amalgam preparation okay now coming to the bilayered respiration uh, this is a very very popular technique and for good reason too because it combines the properties of both your glass inomer respiration as well as your composite restoration. Now, there have been a lot of uh, debates on uh, this topic. Uh, many people have uh, questioned, I mean, uh, that why they cannot uh, perform a bilayered restoration on the same day. Now, uh, like I said, there are two schools of thought. Uh, this is, however, my personal feeling. Uh, if you would like to perform a bilayered restoration, please kindly do it in two settings, not one. Uh, my only reason being that the setting time for GIC, the final set for glass inomer cement is 24 hours. So before that, uh, so if you would like to perform it in two days, immediately after applying your glass inomer cement, if you start off with uh, acid etching and washing away and placing the bonding agent, your GIC is not exactly going to be setting. So you might wash away the important components of the GIC uh, before the complexes can form. Uh, because of which the strength of the GIC as well as the fluoride uh, effect, the antibacterial effect of GIC is going to be compromised. Which is why uh, we generally advocate the bilayered restoration to be done in two sittings. So uh, you do the GIC restoration, you fill the entire cavity with uh, GIC in the first sitting and uh, you recall the patient probably after a few days. Uh, see if the patient is asymptomatic. So this is another way of uh, you know, uh, actually having a check on the patient. So you can actually see whether the patient is asymptomatic or symptomatic. So if the patient is asymptomatic, then uh, you remove a layer of the GIC from the restoration and you can replace it with your composite restoration. Uh, earlier, it used to be called a sandwich technique. Uh, it still is referred to a sandwich technique, but uh, personally speaking, I would prefer it if you guys refer to it as a bilayered restoration because we're using two layers of different kinds of restorations. Uh, the reason why I do not advocate the use of the term sandwich is because uh, according to me it's a misnomer uh, because like how we generally make our normal sandwiches uh, in day to day lives. We have a layer of bread as the lowermost layer followed by whatever uh, is your filling of choice. 
whether it be meat or whether it be cheese or some vegetables followed by another layer of bread on the top so the top and the bottom layers are the same but when it comes to the sandwich technique practiced in dentistry the lower most layer is going to be your tooth structure followed by glass cyanomer and composite and uh, on top of it there is no more tooth structure so the top and the bottom layers are actually different so i would prefer it if you uh, instead of calling it a sandwich we we refer to it as a bilayered restoration so now there are two different types of uh, bilayered restorations uh, we have the open as well as uh, the closed type so in the open kind of uh, of bilayered uh, technique Uh, you can see the glass cyanomer cement is actually exposed to the oral cavity so uh, if you can appreciate it in the first uh, figure you can actually see that on the proximal surface your glass cyanomer cement uh, is actually uh, in contact with the oral cavity whereas uh, when it comes to the closed uh, sandwich or the bilayered uh, restorative technique the glass cyanomer is completely hidden uh, by the composite restoration this can be appreciated in your class 1 and class 6 type of uh, restorations uh, i hope it is clear it's very simple uh, bilayered restoration it combines the best of both worlds so you have the antibacterial effect of uh, uh, your uh, glass cyanomer restoration because of uh, the fluoride uh, it possesses and of course it chemically bonds to the tooth surface because of which uh, you do not have to worry about micro leakage uh, followed by the superior aesthetic results uh, and finish of your composite restoration uh, glass cyanomer cement uh, it's interesting to know that because of the chemical bond it is the only restorative material known to man which actually bonds to the tooth surface and which uh, possesses uh, chemically bonds to the tooth surface and which possesses uh, you know this uh, antibacterial effect because of which another name for glass cyanomer cement is also uh, man made dentine so it's an interesting uh, trivial fact uh, composites uh, although they have the superior uh, aesthetics and uh, finishability properties the major drawback of composite is the polymerization shrinkage so what happens over time is that uh, as and when the restoration deteriorates it kind of pulls away from the the surface of the tooth because of which there are going to be uh, minor discrepancies or gaps present between the restoration and the tooth surface with time and that is the site where secondary caries and uh, micro leakage happens because of which the tooth gets secondarily infected and uh, that leads to the failure of uh, the complex restoration which you would have performed uh, because of which uh, bilayered restorations are uh, very very popular they they were very popular they are and i hope they will continue to be popular uh the only thing is that uh, you have to do it in two sittings yeah okay so now coming to smart birds okay so these are uh, yeah actually speaking they are very smart because uh, although you may not be able to see it uh these smart birds can actually sense uh, the portion of the cavity which is infected so i hope you remember that there are two types of uh, carious dentine you have the infected which is the soft and uh, darker colored uh, uh sorry the lighter colored uh, followed by the affected dentine which is uh, the harder the more leathery and the darker colored uh, affected uh, i mean uh, carious dentine so the soft infected dentine uh, cannot be remineralized it ca- it cannot uh, convert back uh, uh, to a healthy state because of which it has to be removed uh, under all circumstances the affected dentine uh, you have to take a judicious call so uh, especially when uh, the cavities are quite deep and you are uh, you have the fear of approaching the pulp and you wish to not sacrifice uh, uh, the tooth structure to uh, a sitting of uh, root canal treatment then you can leave behind affected dentine it is considered to be safe and uh, uh, ethically acceptable uh, uh so in in such cases these birds which are uh, created from reinforced polymer so they are glass bead reinforced polymer they will only uh, remove your soft carious dentine and they will leave the affected dentine and the and the non carious dentine intact uh, even if you keep running the burr on the tooth surface it will not prepare or cut through the the tooth surface so that is one way of restricting yourself from 
pulpal exposure exposures and unnecessarily removal of tooth structure so yeah uh, although they are uh, a tad more expensive uh, it can be considered as a wise and a good uh, investment in future okay before mentioned cal and uh, yeah, you just have to apply a layer for uh, of this papain gel onto the uh, the affected carious tooth and it will uh, actually disintegrate the the caries which is present and leave behind only healthy tooth structure okay now coming to air abrasion so basically air in air abrasion is uh, a kind of preparation which does not involve the use of your air rotor or micro motor however it uh, makes use of a strong jet of air which uh, possesses uh, abrading particles uh, the most popular one being aluminum oxide so uh, it is shot in a stream uh, of high pressure yeah so it is uh, generated from compressed air and uh, the the particle size is important so it ranges between 27 to 50 microns in diameter and uh, so what basically happens is when these abrasive particles they strike the tooth surface with high velocity they actually remove portions of your tooth structure so this can be done to remove caries it can be done to prepare cavities uh, it can be done uh, uh, yeah it can be done for the above mentioned uh, uh, processes uh you will see uh, there is a link uh, on the slide below so you can actually uh, watch a video on how uh, the air abrasion works It's an interesting concept uh next coming to the laser uh, laser stands for the light amplification by stimulated emission of uh, radiation it's very popular i'm sure you've all come across it in the department of periodontics because we do have the soft tissue laser there Uh, please understand we have soft tissue lasers and we have hard tissue lasers depending upon the the type of laser which we are going to be using and for the purpose so hard tissues of course we use it for preparing the hard tissues and soft tissues is what we use to prepare the soft tissues uh, so of course in the department of periodontics we are having the soft tissue laser so it can be used to treat a number of uh, uh, dental conditions and uh, it's one of the more recent advances and it's pretty cool it's pretty cool to watch uh, there's a video you can you can have a look uh, it's shared uh, on the link below and uh, yeah so the hard tissue procedures uh, you can use it for uh, cavity detection you can use it for cavity preparation you can use it for uh, so that you can do your dental fillings you can also use it to treat tooth sensitivity yeah so if you would have noticed uh, a lot of patients walk in with uh, sensitivity as their chief complaint so we do have a number of uh, solutions for uh, hypersensitivity we have uh, your uh, colgate sensitive or you have your sensodyne toothpaste and uh, we have the chemical components in the dental clinics we have the gluma desensitizer or we can also burnish the exposed dentin surfaces with uh, a ball burnisher uh, and so on and so forth however they are all not uh, the permanent kind of uh, treatment so sensitivity keeps uh, coming back to haunt the patients uh, after a time period so yeah so it is uh, one of the more pressing problems in the community nowadays so lasers can be used to treat uh, sensitive teeth because they seal the tubules of the tooth surface uh, after they create uh, the smear layer yeah so that smear layer is actually used uh, to seal the tubules on the tooth surface because of which the sensitivity decreases or vanishes the soft tissue procedures uh, you can use it for crown lengthening this, this is what the department is using it primarily for you can use it to treat your tongue ties uh, uh, i'm sure you've heard of tongue ties uh, the department of uh, oral surgery has also been treating cases of tongue ties uh, from time to time you can use it to treat uh, gummy smiles so you can use it to reshape your gum tissues as well okay now coming to calcium hydroxide this is one of the most uh, important uh, uh, discoveries in the field of dentistry uh, so i think we should give credit to the person who has uh, introduced it as well uh, his name is herman and he introduced it into in the year uh, 1920 so calcium hydroxide on own is highly alkaline so 
because of this highly alkaline environment it uh, it creates an environment which is favorable for the formation of reparative dentin and uh, it also has the capability to mobilize growth factors from the dental matrix which causes the formation of uh, new dentin which is why it is very very popular uh, to be used for both your uh, direct and your indirect pulp cappings so please try and understand calcium hydroxide uh, is not to be used as a base or a restorative material it is very weak and brittle in nature so it will easily crumble or fracture under uh, masticatory forces so it has to be used as a sub base because of which you are going to apply it only uh, in the spot where it is necessary and in minute quantities alone so this is a common mistake which uh, keeps happening in the clinics where we tend to overuse calcium hydroxide uh, please uh, try and understand calcium hydroxide has to be used only uh, to the extent of the tip of the size of your ball burnisher only that much amount is required in fact uh, when you are mixing uh, your uh, calcium hydroxide uh, used for direct and indirect pulp capping that is your dical uh, yeah, uh, there is a specific instrument which has been dedicated for the mixing of dical it is called as the dical applicator so that resembles a small ball burnisher so only the tip of the ball burnisher is to be coated with dical and introduced into the deepest uh, portion of your cavity so please do not apply it in bulk or all across the floor of the cavity because uh, under the masticatory forces it will collapse and it will break yeah so uh, like i was saying uh, we do have uh, different types of uh, uh, calcium hydroxide we we use it as an intracanal medicament for doing our endodontic procedures uh, because it, because of its uh, antibacterial efficacy and uh, till date calcium hydroxide is the only uh, uh, kind of uh, ammunition we have against uh, e fecalis that is your enterococcus fecalis uh, this is the bacteria which is primarily responsible for the failure of your endodontic therapy so in case if patients come back for uh, re root canals you have to have to have to uh, sterilize the root canals after you remove the previous obturating material that is your gutta perka uh, with uh, you have to sterilize it with your calcium hydroxide at least for a week yeah so calcium hydroxide uh, alone has the capability to eradicate your e fecalis from the root canals another uh, more important use like i mentioned before is the use for your direct and indirect pulp capping so we have two different types of uh, the capping agents you can either have the manual mixing one that is your dical which is uh, popular in the two paste system so you have two tubes you have to mix uh, minute equal uh, portions of both and you and it sets fast mind you so you have to uh, work a little fast so immediately after mixing you place it into the dry sterile cavity in the deepest portion uh, another one which has been introduced which is more common is uh, the terracal that is your light cured uh, calcium hydroxide so that is more convenient as in you don't have to waste time in mixing uh, it appears in a single syringe and it sets only in the presence of your curing light however uh, that again you have to be quick because we do not uh, want to waste time um, during which the cavity can get contaminated yeah so immediately after dispensing it into the cavity into the deepest portion using the syringe tip you have to cure it and then it sets uh there there has been a lot of confusion uh, regarding the uh, the application of uh, terracal which i would like to just uh, clarify uh, many many people feel that uh, the uh, before uh, i mean like when you are going to be performing your uh, deep caries management and instead of using gic if you would like to proceed directly with composite there's no harm in it uh, especially if the patient cannot afford another sitting uh, or another appointment so in such cases after you apply your terracal in the in the deepest portion of the cavity you have to restore it with your composite restoration so in such cases uh, the confusion arises whether you actually etch the tooth surface prior to applying the terracal or after applying the terracal so it is my opinion that terracal is actually used as a pulp protecting agent so uh, especially if the cavity is deep i would prefer it if the 
the traumatic uh, insult to the pulp can be minimized. So we apply the Terracal first, we cure it and then after that we proceed to apply the etchant and the bonding agent. So we are actually protecting the pulp from these chemical insults of the 37% uh, phosphoric acid and the monomer liquid. Yeah, so, so I hope that clears out the confusion. If there are any further doubts, please do uh, get back to me regarding this. Okay, so that was the role about hydroxide. Uh, this uh, minimal intervention dentistry topic, it actually uh, raises a very important question on whether we would like to repair the cavity or whether we should replace it. So uh, in earlier times, we, uh, when we used to practice uh, amalgam restorations, uh, there's no point in even discussing this topic because amalgam restorations cannot be repaired. So if an amalgam restoration has fractured, the entire thing has to be removed again and you have to do a cavity uh, a restoration again because amalgam restorations, uh, the new amalgam restoration will have no way of bonding to the tooth surface and to the existing old amalgam restoration. So, but now because of the advent of tooth colored restorative materials which actually adhere uh, to the tooth surface, uh, whether repair is enough or whether it should be replaced. So basically this has to be taken as a call uh, at the time during the examination of the patient. So there are various factors which need to be examined. The first is uh, you have to check the caries risk assessment for the patient. So if the patient's caries risk assessment is high, uh, there is a chance that uh, the existing restoration would have been contaminated and uh, that means the old restorations might require to be removed and uh, replaced because you can actually, uh, you know, upon removal of the existing restoration only, you can actually assess whether there is uh, caries below. Of course, you can uh, take IOPAs to check for secondary caries, but many times, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, IOPAs and uh, radiographic investigations are not enough, you know, because sometimes uh, because of the radio opacity of your uh, uh, tooth color restoration, that is your composite, you may not be able to appreciate the slight or the minute amounts of your uh, radiolucency, that is your dental caries underneath the restoration. So if the caries risk is high, you may want to consider removing the existing restoration if you see that the margins are contaminated with caries. Yeah. Uh, after that, uh, if the caries index is low and you see that only the margins are contaminated and the patient is asymptomatic, we may want to excavate only the areas of the margin and the small portion of the restoration leaving the deeper portion intact so that uh, we do not uh, traumatize the pulp further. Uh, and then we just uh, restore it on uh, restore it uh, re-restore it back again so because the composite restorations have the ability to adhere to each other once the etching and the bonding have been done uh, they should not pose as much of a problem uh, then again uh, yeah so then uh, if the prognosis of the restoration is poor so that means uh, especially when it comes to the proximal surfaces if you see that uh, the contour and the contact which is given is very poor or if there is a gingival overhang, even though the patient will be asymptomatic, I would suggest that you remove the existing restoration and redo it because it is going to be influencing the occlusion and the masticatory processes and, uh, and the dispersion of the forces due to mastication. So it is always better to redo it and give proper proximal contacts so that uh, the adjacent teeth are also not suffering uh, and uh, they do not get more prone to a caries attack. Okay. So these are uh, some uh, these are some considerations which you have to keep in mind uh, when you assess whether the tooth in question will actually benefit from a new one or whether repairing it is uh, more than enough. Uh, so another rule which you can keep in mind is uh, replacement should only take place if the practitioner cannot manage the defective areas without removing the entire restoration or if there are pulpal symptoms yeah so this can be kept in mind uh, so this can also be uh, taken into jurisdiction when you are actually uh, treating a patient who has multiple restorations uh, it has been observed that uh, even the repaired restorations uh, they remain stable over a seven year period so repair is also not a bad option so you can keep it in mind uh, 
Also, you can keep most of the original restoration intact. It is only the new areas which are affected by caries which are removed uh, and uh, re-restored. So that is uh, a point uh, of uh, performing your repair rather than replacing the entire restoration. So the integrity of the tooth as well as the existing restoration is maintained. This is the caries uh, risk assessment chart uh, which uh, we all are following uh, right now. So I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, you ask uh, when you're screening the patient you ask him a lot of questions about his history his diet then of course you perform your clinical assessment you check the compliance of the patient you formulate an opinion of your own about the patient uh, patient's oral cavity and uh, of course you have i mean like after you take all these things into consideration you you categorize the patient's uh, risk as either low medium moderate or high uh, based on which you can recall the patient sooner or at a more delayed stage. So for the low and the medium to moderate risk uh, patients, you can recall the patient uh, around uh, once every six months. Whereas the, the, the high caries index patients might have to be recalled every two to four months. Preferably three, three months is a safe bet so that you can constantly monitor them and, uh, and you, can, you can decide on whether you need to you know, uh, intervene in, in between or not. So I hope uh, this lecture was clear. I hope there are no doubts. If there are, please feel free to post your comments in the comment section below. Uh, I'm always approachable. I'm always there to solve your doubts. Uh, you can always get in touch with me. Uh, so this brings